Good morning, good people. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm vertically. No, no. I'm, I'm, I'm vertically challenged. It's about the right height for me. Is that all right? Um, I have all these little children that like me, and I think it's because they're thinking, we're about the same height, you know, <laughs> we're friends, we're on the same level. So, um, I was supposed to bring last week's message, but as all of you know, I was falling flat on my face in that little corner. So, I switched with Bethany. I was like, no, I can't do last week's message. I will do this week's message, which is um, a message to the king. The sermon is on the message to the king. But if I had known all that would happen in Britain in the last seven days, I'd have picked last week's message. (laughs) I have said, forget that message to the queen. I, I like this one. It's looking nice and simple. I don't want message to the king anymore. So, but before um, we go on, um, because I didn't expect that everybody would read Isaiah chapter 36 to 39, or that everybody would know it. Um, There would be some who would know it, there will be some who will not know it, but that is what the, um, the sermon on the message to the king is on. So I will give you a summary of the chapters just to save you all time and to to make sure that everybody is on a level playing field. Sennacherib was the king of Syria and he sends a message to the king of Judah, to the king of Judah. The king of Assyria He comes with a very great army. When he sends the message, he means business. He comes with a large army, a great army. And the king of Assyria, he taunts Hezekiah, who is the king of Judah. And he tells him that he cannot rely on Egypt to save him. That Egypt is a spent force. He says that Hezekiah has destroyed all the high places and altars, so there could be no help from there either. You've destroyed it, so you can't be expecting help from there. He added that he will give Judah 2,000 horses if they can muster up 2,000 people to ride the horses. He added that Hezekiah could not deceive the people by saying the Lord would deliver them. He finished up that the Lord had told him to destroy Judah. So Hezekiah tore his clothes, he covered himself in sackcloth, and he went into the house of the Lord. And he declared prayers for the remnant of Israel. He took the letter from the king of Assyria and he spread it before God in the temple. You know Hezekiah means business. I have brought the letter they sent to me before you. I am king, but then I'm going to meet the king of kings. He stated that the kingdoms that Assyria had laid waste and burnt their gods, were gods made by man. But that him who is God alone will deliver Judah and he will show that he alone is God. God replies through Isaiah that Assyria will not lay a siege against Jerusalem nor shoot an arrow there, 
nor come into the city, but that the king of Assyria will return to Assyria just as he came. Note, he brought a great army when he was coming. He didn't just come in. But he said he will return just as he came. So, he promised that he would defend the city, not only because he is God, but because of his servant, David. How many years later, David is still ringing bells? You'd have thought, you know, David is the spent force. Not Egypt, but dead. They're still saying, I will protect the city because of my servant, David. God also promised that the king of Assyria had mocked the Holy One of Israel. That he would destroy him. Then the angel of God went and they and the angel of the Lord killed a hundred and eighty-five thousand soldiers in the camp of the Assyrians. So if somebody comes get to to wage war against you with at least a hundred and eighty-five thousand people, he's not joking. He's not playing. And just as God had said. The king of Assyria went back home just as he came. Hezekiah then becomes sick. And Isaiah told him to get his house in order because he would die. Hezekiah prayed and wept to the Lord. And the Lord sent Isaiah back. That he had heard Hezekiah's prayers. And that he had added another 15 years to his life. Then Baladan, the son of the king of Babylon, hearing of Hezekiah's miracle cure and recovery, came to visit him. And Hezekiah showed him everything he had. Everything. Isaiah then came and prophesied to Hezekiah that everything he had shown to the son of the king of Babylon will be carried away to Babylon. Hezekiah was content with this as he thought, as long as there's peace and security in my days, what do I care about the future? So, this very interesting king, I had to do a background check on him. And in a week where a woman is getting so much stick, and I'm neither for nor against Theresa May, but I think I would almost call what she's going through bullying. That's just me thinking that. So, but Hezekiah, when I did a background check, is someone who makes me very proud of women. I think the women should give themselves a round of applause before I go any further. <laughs> <laughs> because Hezekiah is a real case of the hand that rocks the cradle, rules the world. Judah had had a lot of kings that had followed other gods and had gone into idolatry. There was a proliferation of altars and high places where they worshipped various gods in Judah by the time Hezekiah came to the throne. But when Hezekiah came to the throne, he purified and repaired the temple. He purged its idols. He reformed the priesthood. And he abolished the worship of idols from his kingdom. Amen. Scholars and learned men they might have various reasons for this. Why didn't he follow what other kings of Judah had done and worshipped other gods? They might have other reasons for this. But I strongly believe, I strongly believe that it was because of his mother, Abijah. And you ask me, who is Abijah? Well, Hezekiah's mother, surprise, surprise. 
is the daughter of the high priest, Zachariah. And to crown it all, who did Hezekiah himself marry? He married Hepzibah. Who is Hepzibah? The daughter of Isaiah. He was a person surrounded by strong women who gave him excellent counsel. And he followed it. He centralized the worship of God in the temple. He invited other tribes to come to Jerusalem and observe the Passover. They mocked him. But he had stretched out a hand of fellowship to other people. So when the king of Assyria came and was mocking him that he had destroyed the altars and the high places, he was looking at it just from the outside, wasn't he? He had no clue that he was fighting not only Hezekiah, he was fighting what is right. This is the right way. And we are not compromising. Hezekiah is not compromising. He's not wavering. He's not unstable in all his ways like unstable men. No, he faces and focuses on God. So the king of Assyria is fighting. There is nothing as bad as fighting a fight of blame, a fight that is wrong. He is fighting what is right. But most of all, he is mocking the Lord Most High. And we all know what happens when you mock the Lord Most High. So there are a few lessons that I've taken from these chapters, and I will share them with you. I am aware that it's going to be a long day for some of us, so I will try and keep it as brief as possible. The first thing I'm going to share with you is that the Lord has said it. Will he not accomplish it? The Lord said the king of Assyria will go back the way he came. There is a fulfillment of prophecy. Let, let, let me, let's backtrack a little. There is a prophecy of Micah in, in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will rule over Israel, whose origins are of old, from ancient times. Between that prophecy and the fulfillment of that prophecy, there were 700 years. So sometimes we pray and we're like, I've never heard of Six months, I've not heard a reply to my prayer. 700 years, there was. So in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 30, um, chapter 37, verse 31, the Lord says through Isaiah, his servant, his prophet, and the surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Today, do we not have a remnant of the house of Judah in Jerusalem? Even in the immediate time when that prophecy was made, the king of Assyria did not manage to destroy Jerusalem. So the answer is, when the Lord says something, he will accomplish it. In verse 5, the Lord said, I will make him fall, talking about the king of Assyria, I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. Not in Judah that he has come to lay siege on, but he will go back home and I will make him fall when he gets to his own land. In 37, verse 37, it says, 
Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went home and dwelt in Nineveh. And in chapter 38, it says, And he was worshipping in the house of Nisroi, his god, Adram Melech and Sherezah, his sons, slew him with the sword and escaped into the land of Er 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 Escaped, escaped into the hand of Ararat. And Esrahadun, his son, reigned in his stead. Do you know that these chapters, they convince me of the truth of Psalm 90 verse 4? That a thousand years in your sight is like a day just gone by. Because when I researched between verse 37 where I said the king departed and verse 38 there was a passage of 20 years his sons did not kill him until 20 years later and it just seemed as if seamlessly it happened it just seemed as if we went from one thing no so our time is not God's time. <clears throat> Prophecy might tarry, but it will come to pass. Another thing is I found in this chapter is that he does not treat us as we deserve. But his nature is always to show mercy. Now the king of Assyria stands before Judah and tells that tell, tells them that if they can come up with 2,000 men to ride horses, he will give them 2,000 horses. I mean, that's rubbing salt in a wound, isn't it? And not only am I opposing you, I'm mocking you as well, you know. There's some things that are just not done. Okay, I know I'm stronger, but what if, if you can muster up 2,000? So they didn't even have 2,000 cavalry men in the whole of Judah. In the whole of they ha- they didn't have 2,000 men. But the king of Assyria had at least 185,000 men. Because we know that the angel of God slew 185,000 men. And some still went back home with the king. Just doing the maths. I mean, it's <coughs> logical. Sorry, Tate. It's fine. <laughs> so by from all from all in all logic, Assyria should, you know, just walk all over Judah. That's what Judah deserves. But the Lord didn't do that. Then when the Lord spares Hezekiah, what does he do? He lets in the Babylonians. And he starts showing off. Rather than give glory to God, I'm well. I give God all the glory. Full stop. Isn't that it? No, no, no. Come. Come and see all that I have. He went on a boasting spree. If I was Babylon, that would have been the perfect time to do, to do a Trojan horse on them. You know, just come in. They've let me in, haven't they? And take away all the people of Judah and all that they have. It would have been, nobody would have blinked and I would have said mm, very good tactics. Mm, that kind of tactics we're still talking about today. So would have thought, excellent. But again, the Lord had mercy on Hezekiah. But the Lord wants him. That that which you have shown the Babylonians on your boasting spree, they will carry it all away. When we walk aright with God, 
and we pray to him. No matter how hopeless our situation looks, God hears and responds. Hezekiah had done away with the worship of idols. He destroyed the high places and the altars in Judea. He had repaired the temple. He had centralized the worship of God. You could only worship Yahweh in the whole land of Judah. So is it any wonder that the Lord removed armies for for him? On his behalf, the Lord slew armies. When you walk aright with your God, it's the case of when you have done all you can, then you will stand. That wonderful song that I love so much. I have done all I can. Now I will just stand and wait for the glory of the Lord, for his mercies to come upon me. Because undoubtedly he barred his mighty arm on behalf of Hezekiah. You have followed me. You have followed my strictures. You have obeyed my commandments. And I will answer you in the day of trouble. In the day of trouble, you will never be without mercy. Because you have walked aright with your God. And... Oh, something that goes all the way through the Bible is that God will not be mocked. I'm going to read again from um, Isaiah chapter 36. Beware, lest Hezekiah, this is the king of Assyria talking, <clears throat> beware, lest, lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying the Lord will deliver you. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arab? Where are the gods of Seraphim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? That your Lord will deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. And the Lord replies in chapter 37, verse 23. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes? Against the Holy One of Israel? Because you have raged against me and your arrogance has come to my ears. I will put a hook in your nose and my beat in your mouth and I will return you back on the way by which you came. There are always dire repercussions when you mock the God. When you mock our king. There is, there is a reason, you know, when we mock him, he shows us why he is called the Lord God of hosts. He deals ruthlessly. 185,000 were slain. 185,000. He rises. He doesn't need us to contend for him. He can contend for himself. Don't, I've been the one who is mocked. Don't worry about it. I've got this, as teenagers see. I've got this covered. I'm so all over this. The only person who you can have a covenant or agreement with who will not fail is God Almighty. Whether it's a spouse, a partner, a child, a friend, the arm of flesh will surely fail. Any successful marriage, anybody here will tell you, is a marriage of two people who forgive. That's the success of any marriage. They forgive each other. Because there's no how we do not hurt and disappoint each other. That is the nature of man. 
Why would Titi, who is single, bring this up? Because before the king of Assyria made all, started all this palaver, you won't believe it, before he renewed this assault against Judah, Hezekiah had already paid Assyria 300 talents of silver and 30 of gold. <clears throat> and it's not like Judah had that kind of money lying around. The door of the temple had to be used to produce that. It's only God who's, who, who looks at our inadequacies and appreciates the widow's might we give to him. Because I'm going to put it in today's terms. I'm not a mathematician. But one talent. Remember that he gave 300 talents. One talent of gold is equal to <clears throat> 34 kilograms. One talent of gold is equal to 42 kilograms. Now, on today's market where gold is so much, so can you, the mind boggles. One talent is 42 kilograms. And he gave 30. And how much does one kilogram of gold sell for? 42,517 dollars. One kilogram. So multiply one, one kilogram by 34, then you now multiply that by what is going on in. And as for silver, he gave 300. Still the same. Still the same. A talent is 34 kilograms. Still the same. But it's cheaper. It's for 547 per kilo. So he gives you all that. In tribute, in agreement that you would leave his country alone and you still betray him. You cannot have an agreement with the devil. He will demand your very soul and still be dissatisfied mm. when he gets it. It is only God whose mercies are new every morning. Everybody else is out for themselves. I'm going to end by saying that we're all subjects of the Most High God. Whether we're sovereign, noble, gentry, or commoners. And that in the midst of the turmoil, he remains God. King Hezekiah is sovereign of Judah, but he's subject to God by the lengthening of his days. The king of Assyria, who thinks is all powerful, <clears throat> is turned back and returned home the way he's, he's come. And he is killed at home, just as God has promised. His soldiers both com commoners and commanders, nobles, all of them, they have no knowledge of Yahweh, but they are slaughtered. Ignorance does not give you a free pass with God. In the midst of any calamity, he is God. Imagine being Hezekiah. One moment you have Assyria at your neck, breathing down your throat, you know, intent on destroying you. The next you are ill. 
and you get a death sentence. A death sentence is delivered to you. You don't know if you're coming or going, you know. Everything is just going wrong. I had a small inkling of that just last week during the sickle cell fundraising dinner. As you all know, I had that last week. And I can tell you it was truly horrendous. Hand on heart, I can tell you that. First, the caterer left me a voicemail. The caterer from last year left me a voicemail. No, she didn't have the nerve to call me. The week before, she she sent me, she left me a voicemail. You know one of those voice notes that you sent, that you just sent, that's what she did. She didn't call me. She said she was ill, she can't cook, she didn't. Then the MC called me the week before. And he basically, he gave me some cock and bull story. But the long and short of it was, he's going to another event. He doesn't think our event is worth it. He's found something better. And then at 3.15 on Saturday, our star attraction for the evening sent me a message. I'm not coming. Three PM she sent that email. Start time five PM. So we corralled a caterer in. She came with the food, but she left the lighter to keep the food warm at home. Who does that? <laughs> the cocktail person turned up. But she turned up without any ice to put in the drinks. <laughs> By this time, we're taking food, running to Sheila's house to put it on the fire and warm it and running back to Brox, to Beaufort Center. That's what we did. It was raining cats and dogs. As the rain was falling on me, I was telling myself, remember this next year. This is the end. You are never doing another one. <laughs> you are not involving yourself in another madness, another year. You have to remember today. Then my friend assured me that the devil wouldn't be so interested in her. In our event, if great things were not going to come forth from it. And that is just a teensy wincy event that I was running last week. So imagine how Theresa May must feel. In June 2016, we had a vote to leave Brexit or to leave Europe. Then David Cameron was our prime minister and he wanted us to remain in Europe. Immediately he lost the vote. He resigned and moved to the south of France. It's nice for some, isn't it? <laughs> so Theresa May took up the mantle. She went to Europe and she managed to get a deal. Might not be ideal. I don't know the details. Since she's got that deal, six ministers have resigned. Six. Not one, not two. Six. Some MPs have called for a leadership contest and are thinking of passing a vote of no confidence in her leadership. All I can say in that, in the midst of this tumult, I hope she's looking to God because only he can give wisdom. I'm going to leave you with this. Sometimes when things seem to be falling apart, it is actually God putting things in place. Thank you.